The assembly of national spirits constitutes a circle of shapes which now embraces the whole of nature as well as the whole ethical world. They stand, too, under the supreme command of the one rather than under his sovereignty. By themselves, they are the universal substances of what the self-conscious essence in itself is and does. This, however, constitutes the power and in the first instance, the center at least with which those universal beings are concerned and which at first seems to merge their affairs only contingently. But... It is the return of the divine being into self-consciousness that already contains the reason why self-consciousness forms the center for those divine powers and conceals their unity to begin with under the form of a friendly external connection of the two worlds. Paragraph 728 is now helping to elaborate the side of the divine, of the gods in a plurality, but also with, you could say, a certain kind of unity, although it's, it's a contingent and somewhat fragmentary unity that is in the process of being developed. And what we see here is this is helping us to understand what the pantheon, the all the gods reference in the previous paragraph is actually going to look like in relation to human beings. But here in this paragraph, as opposed to the the next one, it's the totality of the divine existences that is being elaborated. There's not a lot of discussion of the relation to human beings, whether it be that of the type of artist that Miller is going to translate in the next paragraph as the minstrel, or the heroes and kings and other important peoples that are going to get depicted in the first kind of language, the first kind of artistry and poetry that Hegel is going to devote some some serious attention to, that of the epic. So what do we have? We could call this, in a certain respect, the ideology or the developmental picture of what the gods are. And and this is quite interesting because there is an important set of resolutions that are taking place here. So he says the assembly of national spirits. Let, let's start with that. Assembly for Zamlung. Um, this is not a complete unity. This is not an organic state or anything like that. This is a, a bunch of gods being put together in some sort of association National spirits here is not national geisten, right? It's uh, folk that is being used for nation here. And what should that mean for us? Well, think about the previous paragraph and this process of bringing the different national spirits together into some greater unity politically. And that's going to be referenced here in terms of the rulership, region, that was referenced in the previous paragraph with respect to human rulers, now with respect to the gods. Not using that term region or ordnung as another another term that was used, but using some other political language. So the assembly of the national spirits, he says, constitutes a circle, a kais of shapes, gestalten, and this is very important, which now embraces... The whole of nature, Gantz is the word that's being used there, the totality, if you like, as well as that of the whole ethical world. And here he actually does use the word Welt, as well as Zitlika, right? But he also uses the term Gantz. So we have two totalities, which are to some degree overlapping. We're going to see that the way it's depicted at first is not quite so uh, connected, necessarily connected, but they do overlap. And each of these is a world. So this is particularly important when we look at the very last sentence uh, when he says, um, self-consciousness forms the center for those divine powers, conceals their unity to begin with under the form of a friendly, freundliche, external, außerliche connection of the two worlds. What are the two worlds? Well, the world of nature, and the world 
of the, we could call it culture, the ethical world, the political world. These are connected with each other, but they're viewed as being kind of sundered, split apart, external to each other. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So this assembly of the national spirits is a way in which these things can be brought together. And we can take into account the different kinds of functions that we find in divine pantheons, really, not just for the Greeks, but basically, you know, across religions in general. If you look at religions, they are very often nature gods, gods that represent certain aspects of nature. So let's take, you know, ancient Greece, right? We got Poseidon, who's the sea, very important for a seafaring people, right? We have uh, Demeter, who is the goddess of grain and agriculture generally. We have, we could say Hera as the representative of generation, pregnancy, motherhood, all of those sorts of things. Already, though, we're starting to creep into the ethical world with that. Maybe one reason why Hera is so jealous is because Zeus is such a complete jerk going around and, and uh, getting it on with all sorts of other human women and, and forsaking his, his wife when he ought not to do so. Um, and we could talk about Dionysus and we could talk about other nature deities as well. There are all sorts of deities, uh, sort of minor ones of particular streams. There's the, you know, dryads and there's all sorts of other things. The winds themselves are semi-divine or divine, depending on how you look at it. So we have deities within this assembly representing the natural world. We also have deities representing the ethical world, the world of zitta, of morals. And it's not a complete unity. Um, there's, there's actually, you know, if we take the ancient Greeks, right, we have two different gods who have something to do with war directly. We have Ares, who represents the destructive, bloodthirsty side of war. We have Athena, who represents strategy. And they're both essentially war gods, right? We have... Uh, um, Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, perhaps that's also nature, but perhaps that's also a distinctively human activity. Um, we have Apollo, you know, a god who performs several different roles, prophecy, the sun, music. Uh, we could go on and on. And then, of course, we have Zeus, right, who is the ruler of this pantheon, but kind of a loosey-goosey ruler, right? He doesn't often use his authority, and uh, sometimes he's not obeyed. <laughs> So we have all of this. And if we looked at other pantheons in other cultures, we would find similar things. So just to take a few examples, right? If we look at, you know, the Vedic religion, there's all sorts of nature gods. But there's also Varuna who represents order, right? And there's also uh, Mitra who, who represents, you know, sort of defense, uh, we could go on and on, like, you know, f going from Greece all the way up into, you know, the, the Germanic, into the Indo-Iranian, into uh, going further uh, east into China, where there, oh my, there's so many gods <laughs> that arise. And we would find the same thing basically occurring in every complexly developed religious culture. As a matter of fact... Even among fairly nomadic uh, cultures, we're going to find much of this happening. So he goes on and he says, they, that's the Assembly of National Spirits, stand under the supreme command of the one, in this case Zeus, rather than under his sovereignty. So this is an interesting distinction. Supreme command, over befail, right? A, a, a command, a limited set of orders, Order is another word for befail, right? Sovereignty, Oberherrschaft. It's not something that is institutionalized and made permanent all, you know, once for all. Although you could say, well, when is Zeus going to lose his, his sovereignty? Well, you know, if one of his kids, uh, you know, takes him out or something like he did with his dad, um, which is, which is a, a concern that, that he could have. Or, you know, if the religion loses its efficacy, which is what happened historically. Um, 
Why is Hegel stressing this? Well, this is connected to that point that he was making in the previous paragraph about how it is that a common project, uh, uh, you know, Gesamte Handlung, brings them together. And we could say that this is a common project of keeping the cosmos and the ethical portion of it as well in existence and functional. So he goes on and he says, by themselves, these, these gods are the universal substances of what the self-conscious existence in itself is and does. Now, there's a little bit uh, that's been left out in the translation here because this by itself, by themselves, is actually translating für sich, right? Um, the, uh, for themselves, for it, as opposed to the an sich, right? So the in itself. And this is, a, I think, an important point to make. There's, there's, these are being brought together. And then he says, this, however, constitutes the power and in the first instance, the center. Now, center, um, he's not saying zentrum, which would be center. He's actually saying mittelpunkt, which you could translate as center. But given the where we're going next, I think it's good to think of this as the mediating point, the mean, right? Um, the middle, the, the center, he says, at least with which those universal beings are concerned. Now, this is important. What is, what is constituting the center? Um, the universal substance of what the self-conscious essence in itself is and does. There's some, there's some unity underlying this, and it's a unity that's being not seen. It's being concealed. It's being mistaken because... It looks like this assembly merges their affairs only contingently. It just happens to fall out this way that, you know, let, let's think about, for example, the story about how Zeus became king of the gods, right? Um, the three brothers, after they had gotten rid of their, their father, and Zeus was the youngest and, you know, very instrumental in, in that, you got, got uh, Kronos to throw up his consumed children, uh, three girls, three boys. The three boys cast lots for who's going to have what thing. And Poseidon gets the sea, and Hades gets the underworld, and Zeus gets the heaven. And good for Zeus. <laughs> He's now the ruler, right? Um, that appears to be kind of just chance. But there is a sort of internal necessity to this, Hegel is saying. So he says, it is the return of the divine being into self-consciousness. So these are not just figures in a story. They are themselves self-conscious. At least this is how they're being represented, right? Zeus, Zeus is a self-consciousness. Ares is a self-consciousness. Aphrodite is a self-consciousness. And they engage with each other, as self-consciousnesses do, in their story. So he says, the return of the divine being into self-consciousness that already contains the reason why self-consciousness forms the center, mittelpunkt, again, for those divine powers and conceals their unity to begin with under the form of a friendly external connection of the two worlds. Nature and the ethical world are more closely connected, more intimately connected than we originally think when we extricate ourselves at first from nature and stand apart from it we're perhaps on the side in our late modernity, many of us, of seeing too much of this side, the ethical world, and, and sort of an anemic version of nature because we don't spend an awful lot of time. When I would talk to my uh, world religion classes when I first began teaching those classes, one of the things that I would sometimes do is counsel them to go outside and actually find a place where they could look at the sky, put their devices away, and just take in the totality of what the heavens look like and imagine all these roads, buildings, cars not being here and being under the great dome of the sky and thinking what it might be like for ancient peoples. Interesting thought experiment to try to carry out. 
that can help us to understand this whole of nature part in a little way, but does it help us understand the unity that he's talking about here? Not quite yet. But the unity is something concealed at this point. So everything here appears to be contingency when really there is a necessity ruling it. The same universality which belongs to this content attaches necessarily also to the form of consciousness in which the content appears. It is no longer the actual practice of the cult, but a practice that is raised, not, in, not yet indeed into the notion, but at first into picture thinking, into the synthetic linking together of self-conscious and external existence. The external existence of this picture thinking, language, is the earliest language, the epic as such, which contains the universal content of the world, universal at least in the sense of completeness, though not indeed as the universality of thought. The minstrel is the individual, an actual spirit from whom, as a subject of this world, the world is produced and by whom it is born. His pathos is not the stupefying power of nature, but mnesume, recollection and a gradually developed inwardness, the remembrance of essence that formerly was directly present. He is the organ that vanishes in its content. What counts is not his own self, but his muse, his universal song. What, however, is in fact present is the syllogism in which the extreme of universality, the world of the gods, is linked with individuality, with the minstrel, through the middle term of particularity. The middle term is the nation and its heroes, who are individual men like the minstrel, but presented only in idea and are thereby at the same time universal, like the free extreme of universality, the gods. There is a lot of important stuff going on in this paragraph 729. We get introduced to, let's call him a new character, the minstrel or zinger. The bard is another way we could translate this, the composer. And the composer of what? Even more important than the minstrel is this particular use of language in a poetic framework that is the epic and epic poetry. We're thinking, for example, of Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, but we could think of many other epic poems as well. And they are indeed poetry. They, they are not simply prose, cool stories that are being told. They have a structure to them and they are a form of what Hegel here is going to call picture thinking or Vorstellung, as uh, they are also language. And we should think back to the previous subsection. Uh, I've mentioned this several times already. We ended the, the previous subsection, the living work of art, by invoking a new kind of language that would be more adequate than that of the hymn or the oracle or of the frenzy. Well, what is that? It's going to be, for the Greeks, and also for so many other peoples, poetry. Poetry present in the form of epic. And we should pause for a second. Well, what is an epic? You know, we use that term a lot. Oh, man, that's epic. No, that's not the same thing, right? Or this is an epic story, when we're, what we really mean is this is a cool drama, you know? Uh, we talk about epic fantasy as well, and quite frankly, Epic fantasy, if we have in mind, say, George R. Martin or, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien or, um, you know, pick whoever else you want, is not quite the same thing as epic. That word epic as an adjective is different than the epic as a noun. The epic is a long poem that may seem to lack an internal overarching unity, but actually does have it, and it's provided by the things that the gods and the heroes, the human beings, are involved in. So many cultures produce these. They are poetry in Greek and Latin poetry. 
It has to do with uh, the amount of syllables and where the stresses are and whether they're long or short. That's how the rhyme structure works. And the same thing goes, by the way, for tragedy as well. So he, he tells us, here we go, that same, the same universality which belongs to this content, what content, that in, discussed in the previous paragraph, the content of dealing with the gods, attaches necessarily also to the form of consciousness in which the content appears. So the form of consciousness, this is very important. Um, what are we talking about there? Are we just talking about, is it consciousness or self-consciousness? No, we're talking about the way in which things are grasped, understood, perhaps conceptualized or not. And very often in discussing religion in uh, his lectures on the philosophy of religion, it's going to be moving from feeling, gefühl, uh, or perception to Vorstellung, picture thinking, representation, then up to concept or notion, as Miller translates it, begriff, right? And this is not an absolute, like there's dividing lines here and here, and you like cross the threshold. It's much more complicated than that, right? You can have Vorstellung that's much more, you know, Vorstellung y than, than others that are close, some that are closer to begriff, some that are more infected with gefühl, feeling, affectivity. Here he's not actually bringing up affectivity or gefühl as the thing that, that Vorstellung transcends. He's talking about something different, practice. Now, Miller translates this as actual practice, the tun of the cult. Handlung would be closer to practice, but tun can work as well, provided we're understanding it as a sequence of doing similar things over and over again, right? That can be a handlung. <clears throat> so we have an actual practice of the cult that it's not bad, right? It's, it's not like it's not religious, but we're going to transcend it through this new form of language in the epic. He says, it's a practice that is raised, not yet indeed into the notion. That's going to happen later on, but into picture thinking. And here he says something really interesting about picture thinking, doesn't he? What is picture thinking? He's using a term here as a little bit of a digression and also a little bit of a rant. So by now you're all familiar with the notion of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and you probably know that Hegel doesn't actually talk about things in that, that framework. He does often talk about things that we can translate as antithesis, but it doesn't always lead to a synthesis. The Hegelian three-step is actually the product of uh, re you know, reductive attitudes towards Hegel, sometimes superstitious, uh, sometimes fearful, in general, just silly. This is one of the rare points in the phenomenology of spirit where he uses that third term, but he doesn't say synthesis. What does he actually say? A synthetic, all right, so putting things together, synthetic linking together of what? Of self-conscious and external existence. And existence here is Dasein, right? Self-conscious is an adjective here. External is an adjective here. So of, of two kinds of Dasein being brought together synthetically, that is bringing them together, positing them together, linking them together as one with, you know, these two sides, self-conscious and external, oisa. So this is actually, you know, kind of an interesting curiosity. Let's go on, though. I mean, well, but, but before that, so this, this is what he says picture thinking actually is, Vorstellung is. But then he says the external existence of this picture thinking, what is that? Language. Do we think of language as an external existence? Well, we should because it was there before we were born and we were born into a language, which then we learned how to use. And obviously we took that language and transformed it within ourselves, right? Self-consciously quite often in relation to other self-consciousness, but it preceded us and we appropriate what is there. So he says, 
that uh, the external existence of this picture thinking language is the earliest language. The epic as such, now he's not saying this is the earliest language per se, right? It's not as if human beings, uh, you know, whenever they managed to come out of the complete savagery that they, they were in, uh, you know, as, as proto-humans, that they immediately started speaking in epic, right? No, that's, that's not the case. Look at the sentence more closely. He says, um, the epic is such, which contains the universal content of the world. This is the earliest language which contains the universal content of the world. Universal, at least in the sense of completeness, though not indeed as the universality of thought. It's not yet conceptuality. But the epic, Hegel is saying, is the earliest language which contains a kind of totality of the world. And you might say, well, how is that the case? It presents a certain narrative, complex narrative, as a finished product, as the story of an era. Is it com really complete? No. I mean, think about the Odyssey. Uh, so Odysseus is stuck on an island with this goddess Calypso for, what, about six, seven years? And we know that he cries every once in a while and he misses his home and Calypso loves him and they get it on and, and he's moping around. Do we know what he ate on, you know, day 655 of his captivity? Was it, was it fish? Was it nuts? Was it fruit? Was it maybe all three? We don't know. You know, you don't have to have a exhaustive discussion of every single thing to have a coherent and complete narrative. It, it's sort of the nitpickers who, who want that all the time. You know, I mean, we see similar things with like the Gospels, right? What was Jesus doing before, you know, how much did he charge when he, he engaged in carpentry? Who the hell cares? It doesn't matter. It's not part of the story, right? <laughs> Do you like figs? He said that bad thing about a fig tree once. I, I don't know, you know, what's going on with that? You know, we could, we could quibble about that sort of stuff. There is a completeness that's there in an epic, right? And it can be added to. As a matter of fact, epics do develop over time, as we know. But there's a, this is sufficient to it. So he goes on and he says, the universal content of the world, universal in the sense of completeness. And now he says something really interesting. He brings in this character, the minstrel, the zanger. The minstrel is the individual, an actual spirit, a geist, a mind, from whom, as a subject of this world, the world is produced. Now that is worth dwelling on. The minstrel exists as a human being, as an individual, within the language of the society, the culture, the folk, that they are a part of, and that's the condition for being able to make the epic, right? And, you know, if, if we extend this further intergenerationally, you know, we think that Homer wasn't a single guy who came up with all this stuff all by himself. We think there were actually traditions going back a long way, and we could call it like a, a you know, intergenerational building towards these epic poems. And we can say similar things about other epics as well. So the minstrel is working within the language, and then they're also expanding the language in how they're using it to extend it to this world, this narrative world. The world is produced and by whom it is born. Now notice what else Hegel says here. His pathos, what he's undergoing, is not the stupefying power of nature. This is something going out of nature. This is culture now, but a mnesomne, memory, recollection, and a gradually developed inwardness. This is worth pausing on, too. What allows the bard, the minstrel, the composer, to be able to generate characters, many characters, of different orientations who have an interiority, his own interiority. And this means that the bard in a certain sense has to be more than just a single person who's totally unified in their perspective. They have to make space within themselves and within their language 
for these gods and heroes and, and others who they bring in. Cowards, you know, uh, people selling things, whoever else it's going to be. So he goes on and he says, the remembrance of essence that we formerly was directly present, in, formerly directly present in the cult, right? He is the organ that vanishes in its content. What counts is not his own self, but his muse, his universal song. What do we know about Homer? Not much. What do we know about a lot of these people who produce epics or produce other compositions? We know what they have in their compositions. And we're sometimes tempted to identify them with one of their characters, right? That's often a mistake. That's a mistake, by the way, not just for Homer, but for Shakespeare, for Dostoevsky, as, as scholars have pointed out, perhaps even for Borges. So he goes on and he, now he brings up a syllogism. When we have a Hegelian reference to syllogism, think connected uh, reasoning process that also has a metaphysical aspect to it. Mediation is taking place. We have a mitta, uh, sort of like we, in the previous paragraph, we had a, a mittelpunkt. Now we have a mitta, a means, a connector between them. So what is the syllogism here? We have a syllogism with extremes of universality and extremes of individuality, and they are linked through the middle term of particularity. So what are these extremes? The extreme of universality is the world of the gods, the uh, Folkgeister, right? The, the gods of the people that have been brought together now into a pantheon, which has a ruler, but not a emperor or power structure and bureaucracy or anything like that. On the other side, we have the individuality of the bard who does manage to sometimes interject a little reference to himself in there, but who's being lost in the composition. And the middle point of it is what? The nation in its heroes. The nation in its heroes. Not just everybody. We're not trying to have a realistic depiction of social life the way that you know cultural and social historians might want to generate for us. This is a different kind of language. We care about what you know, Heracles is doing, or Jason, or uh, Achilles and Agamemnon. And we also care about what the gods do, you know, like when Achilles is thinking, this friggin' Agamemnon, I'm just going to, like, kill him. I'm going to kill this guy. And Athena, you know, uh, is helping out. Or, you know, when Athena, on the other hand, uh, Ajax is mad at Odysseus, and, and Athena's like, yeah, you should go kill him. As a matter of fact, I'm also going to take your brain out so that you think you're torturing Odysseus when you're torturing a, a sheep. This will be shameful for you. So this middle term, the heroes, is, is very important. And he says that they are individual like the minstrel, but presented only an idea and are thereby universal, like the free extreme of universality of the gods. This is what happens in epic poetry. This is what Hegel is depicting here. And this is a way for us to now connect with the gods through a different kind of of language, something that's an advance, something that's a development. It's not yet conceptual, but it is quite an advance. 